she's uh, crying out, oh, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? I see Leo next to her. They had blood on them. Then I see the defendant. The defendant is an evil and utterly dangerous narcissist and a complete failure. Today's case is one out of every parent's nightmares. These parents thought they took all the right steps in ensuring they found the most competent caretaker they could. They felt they found someone they could trust with what they held most precious in the world. However, the woman who appeared to be kind and compassionate on the surface turned out to harbor some disturbing, dark secrets that culminated in the most horrific, traumatic scene imaginable. Just a warning, this case is a very disturbing one. The details are absolutely horrific, and this case will make your stomach turn. But before we get into the case, though, I want to remind you all to subscribe to my channel if you want to hear more stories like this one. I post multiple times every week, so there's always a new story to hear. Also, be sure to check out these episodes on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, which will be linked down below. With that being said, Let's get into this grisly case. Kevin and Marina Krim were the proud parents to their three children, Lucia, Enos, and Leo. Kevin, a Harvard graduate, was a successful CNBC executive at the time. Marina once worked as a kindergarten teacher who sometimes taught art classes as well, but ultimately became a stay-at-home mom after having their children. The family was originally from San Diego, California, but eventually moved into a ritzy $10,000 a month apartment in a high-rise in the Upper West Side of New York City. Those who knew the family said that Marina put her all into being a mother. She absolutely doted over her children and did her best to raise them into the most caring, kind humans she possibly could. Even though Marina was a stay-at-home mother, though, her and Kevin both placed such a large emphasis on the family working together as a unit. One of their priorities as parents was to teach their kids to take care of one another. They wanted their children to become best friends with one another. And that's exactly what happened as the children grew up. When they took all the kids to the playground, they could all be found playing together. When they went to birthday parties with all sorts of different kids, the three would stick together. Even when they got into fights and arguments as siblings do, they would always end with a hug and an I'm sorry. Lucia, who went by Lulu, was born May 25th, 2006. She was described as a star in everything she did, having this infectious and innocent energy. She was enthusiastic about everything, big and little. She was adventurous and brave. She was nurturing and a natural-born leader, always rallying her little brother and sister to a new task or game. Even when Lulu was feeling shy or uncomfortable in situations, she took it in stride and worked her way through it. Lulu was intuitive and empathic, feeling things deeply and expressing her love freely. She was a little artist who took art classes at the Met and always spent time painting at home. She was creative, and if you knew Lulu, you knew that creating art was like breathing for her. Each Halloween, when Marina was making the kids' Halloween costumes, Lulu would be right beside her, making her own costumes for her dolls out of paper and tape. Inez, who went by Nessie, was born December 28, 2008, and she was the middle child with an older sister and a younger brother. She is known to be the tough one of the three. She's the athletic one, being fast, agile, determined, and fearless. She can read people intelligently and listens intently, then knows exactly how to talk to people and charm her way into their hearts. She's intelligent, quick-witted, with an incredible memory and attention span. Lastly, Leo was born September 30th, 2010. Leo was known to be very smart and curious. He saw the world clearly and loved what he saw. He loved going on stroller rides with his family, always observing and soaking in the people and tall buildings, the construction cranes, trucks, and taxis. He absolutely loved going to the park, collecting acorns and balls with him. Leo was known to be serious at times, deep in thought with a longing look on his face. But most of the time, he was a little clown. He loved making his parents and older sisters laugh whenever he could. His father would go on to say that one of his favorite things to do with Leo was their bedtime ritual. He would always pick his favorite book out of the stack and would have his dad read it to him. Sometimes, Kevin would even end up reading through a book two or three times because of how much Leo loved listening to those stories. Of course, given that this family worked hard to make their children into the most successful versions of themselves, they were all signed up for all sorts of different activities. 
The girls were both signed up for ballet, and it was at one of their classes where Marina met a woman named Celia, who worked for a nanny for one of the families who lived near the Crims and whose children went to the same school as their children. At the time, Marina was still pregnant with Leo when Celia approached her at one of these ballet classes. Celia asked Marina if she needed a nanny, saying that her sister, Yoslin, is looking to nanny. Yaslin Ortega is one of seven children born to her parents in the Dominican Republic. However, two of her siblings actually died in childhood due to illness. Once she was an adult, some of her siblings started moving to New York. It started with the siblings all living together in an apartment, with Yaslin visiting once or twice a year and sending over some money to help get them by. Eventually, though, after finishing college in the DR, she joined her siblings in New York, living in an apartment in Harlem with her sisters and several other family members. There, she worked all sorts of different jobs. She worked at a doll factory, a book factory. She never really actually worked with children until Yoslin moved to Texas and lived with her niece, who had three children. From what I understand, she only lived in Texas for a few months before returning to New York. But at the time, this isn't the impression Celia gave Marina when she introduced Yoslin to her. When Celia told Marina about her sister, she said that she nannied for a few other families over the years. Now, by this point, before even moving to New York, Kevin had suggested that Marina get some help part-time with the kids. At first, this wasn't something she felt she needed. But after moving from San Diego to New York City and now being pregnant with their third child, it was something that she thought about. After all, being in the city with three children is a lot. You can't just, you know, drive your kids around different places like you can in the suburbs. You have to walk and take the train and take taxis. Plus, Kevin traveled a lot for work. So not only was he working full time while Marina was at home with the kids, but there were several days at a time where Kevin would be out of town completely and unable to help with the kids. When Marina met Yaslin for the first time, she seemed like your typical, sweet, caring, middle-aged woman who just wanted to lend a helping hand. Yaslin provided Marina and Kevin with a few references, all who spoke very highly of her and her capabilities when it came to caring for children. According to Kevin, they did their due diligence when it came to hiring a nanny. He had hired many employees over the course of his 18-year-long career, so he knew what he was doing when it came to hiring. He looked up a bunch of questions to ask a potential nanny, sent them to Marina, who then carried out the interview. They followed up with her references, who all gave absolutely glowing reviews of Yoslin and her work. So just after little Leo was born, Marina and Kevin hired then 50-year-old Yoslin on as their nanny. At first, things went well with Yoslin serving as a helping hand. She drove the girls to their ballet and art classes and helped out with their day-to-day -day tasks. And as time went on, she basically became a part of their family. The children called her Josie and would be excited to see her every day. Those who knew Yoslin and the family said that she was always talking about those kids and how much she loved and adored them. She loved her job and the Krim family loved her. Of course, the Krim family knew that Yoslin had a life of her own and given her background, they were more than happy to help support her through everything. They made sure that they always found something for Yaslin to do to ensure that she was never working fewer than 25 hours a week. They didn't ever want to leave her high and dry without work and without pay. When they went on vacation and didn't need her to care for the kids, they would always find other families in the area who also needed nannies. Again, so that even when they didn't need a nanny, they weren't leaving Yoslin with no way to make money. Over the course of Yoslin's employment with the Crims, the family grew really close with her and with even her own family. Once, the Crims went to the Dominican Republic with Yoslin and met one of Yoslin's sisters who hosted them in her home before the family went to their own resort. There was also one occasion where Kevin and Marina purchased plane tickets for Yoslin to go to the DR so she could visit her son and family. The Crims loved Yoslin and her family, and it seems like Yoslin was very happy with the Crims and how they were treating her from the start. Now, by early 2012, Yoslin was finally able to help her son, then 17-year-old Jesus, move from the DR to New York to finish out high school. Upon his arrival, Yoslin moved out of the apartment owned by her sister and into her own apartment in the Bronx with Jesus. 
I want to note that the sister who owned that Harlem apartment also helped raise Jesus until he was 17. So she owned that apartment. A bunch of different family members lived there, but the sister that owned the apartment split her time between New York and the DR. However, after getting her own apartment with Jesus in the Bronx, the financial burden quickly caught up with Yaslin and she could no longer afford it. So she returned back to Harlem into that apartment where she lived with several other family members. Upon his arrival in New York, Jesus enrolled in summer classes at the public high school before switching to a private Catholic school where he could finish out his senior year. Now, the reason for this was because the public school wanted to start Jesus on as a junior, so he'd have to do an extra year of high school before graduating. Meanwhile, the private school allowed him to just do his senior year, so obviously, that was the preferred option. But, as you can imagine, this private school was really expensive, and once again, the financial burden was growing and growing for Yaslin. At this point, they had already lost their apartment in the Bronx, but now, Yaslin was having to pay thousands of dollars per semester in tuition. It was a lot for her to handle. Noticing the financial strain that Yaslin was under, the Crims wanted to help out in any way they could. They offered Jesus a job dog-sitting and house-sitting whenever they were on vacation. He would also come over on a regular basis to walk the dog. Anytime there were big events where maybe the work was too much for Yaslin to handle herself, the Crims would always hire Yaslin's family members to help out. For example, during Marina's sister's wedding, Yaslin's sister went with Yaslin and the family to help watch the kids. Little things like that were ways that the Crims were always trying to help out Yaslin and her family. As the weeks passed, though, with this financial strain getting heavier and heavier for Yaslin, she discussed with the Crims more ways she could make some extra money. She basically asked them to pay her more, so the Crims offered that maybe she could do five extra hours per week of some housework like cleaning, and they could pay her for that. The family really thought that they were doing her a solid by offering her some extra hours in exchange for some extra pay. They also started referring to Yaslin to some other families who were in need of childcare so she could work with extra families when she either wasn't needed by the Crims or she could just pick up extra hours in general because she was only working about 25 hours a week and that way, she could make some extra money. But it seems like this isn't really what Yaslin was expecting when she spoke to the Crims about her money troubles. She started to become unhappy with her job and life in general, so her and Marina started butting heads a bit. Apparently, Marina started to become concerned at Yaslin's job performance in late 2012, saying that she wasn't really doing what she was supposed to do. She was feeding the kids junk food behind Marina's back and wasn't spending as much time with them as Marina was expecting. Marina and Kevin eventually had to tell Yaslin that if she didn't improve her work, they may have to start considering replacing her. And just to note, I'm sure the Crims telling her this was not easy. Again, she was basically like a part of the family. They spent almost every day together. The kids loved her. So her performance must have been slipping very severely and for a long time for the Crims to even consider starting over with a new nanny. The family were hoping that with how generous they had been with her and her family as a whole, and with how much they'd been going out of their way to find ways to pay her for extra work, soon things would look up. But that is not what happened at all. By October 25th, 2012, Yaslin started her day by eating some breakfast with her son, Jesus. By 3 p.m., she went to the Crim's apartment, putting Leo in his stroller before picking Lulu up from school. In the meantime, Marina took her second oldest, Nessie, to her swim lessons. After the swim lessons, Marina was then going to take Nessie to meet Lulu at their ballet lessons. However, when Marina and Nessie arrived to the ballet class, they found that Lulu wasn't there. Yaslin had never dropped her off. This immediately sent a panic through Marina. She started texting Yaslin, where's Lulu, where are you? but she got no response. Of course, after being unable to get into contact with Yaslin and having no idea where her daughter was, Marina headed back to the apartment to find her. When she got there, she describes that it was dark and quiet. She opened the door and first saw Lulu's ballet bag and Leo's stroller, empty and untouched. Marina held Nessie's hand as they walked from room to room through the apartment in complete silence and darkness. 
It was the most eerie and uneasy feeling. Once they made it to the back of the apartment, Marina saw that there was a crack of light coming from under the bathroom door. She opened the door and was immediately horrified at what she saw. First, she saw her six-year-old daughter, Lulu, lying face up in the bathtub, absolutely covered in blood with her eyes wide open, staring off into the distance. Lying next to her in that bathtub was two-year-old Leo. Both were covered in so much blood that they were both almost unrecognizable. Marina said that right away, just by the looks on their faces, the way that they were both just staring off, she knew that both of her children were dead. As soon as Marina saw those kids, she then saw Yoselin standing in the bathroom, covered in blood with her eyes bugging out. The two then locked eyes and suddenly, Yoselin started stabbing herself over and over and over. Marina ran out of that bathroom, clutching then three-year-old Nessie in her arms, screaming, my babysitter killed my kids, as she ran. First responders were called by a neighbor who heard the screaming, which was described as a blood-curdling, bone-chilling scream. Shortly after being called, first responders arrived. When they entered the scene, they found Marina, who was screaming, they're dead, they're dead. When they got to the bathroom, they saw Yoslin lying on the floor, holding a cloth up to her neck to stop the bleeding after stabbing herself in the throat multiple times. There was a bloody knife lying next to her on the floor. It was kind of wrapped in a cloth with a second bloody knife in the sink. The first responder stepped over Yoslin, who at that point was moaning and calling out for help to check in on the children that were both in the tub. He tried to find any signs of life in those two babies, but he found nothing. When first responders started preparing to pick up the bodies of the children to get them onto a stretcher, the medic said that they were so bloody that they were worried they would slip out of their arms when they picked them up. They also helped Yoslin into an ambulance as well. The first responders who had to bear witness to this horrific, bloody scene later described it as the worst, most bloody and violent scene they ever saw. It truly traumatized them for the rest of their lives. Investigators are trying to figure out this morning what could have made a New York family's caretaker turn on the children she was paid to protect. Pull it up. Keep going. Around 5.30 p.m. Thursday night, Marina Krim arrived home from a swimming lesson with her three-year-old to find a gruesome scene. Her other two children, two-year-old Leo and six-year-old Lucia Krim, stabbed to death their nanny lying next to them in an apparent suicide attempt. On the floor of the bathroom is a nanny uh, who apparently had uh, inflicted wounds in her, on her throat. Herbert Klein lives next door and heard the mother screaming. She's uh, crying out, um, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? My life is ruined. I have no children. I have no children. Police escorted Krim from the scene after dark with her only surviving child, a sheet draped over their heads. While this was happening, as Marina had to bear witness to her children lying dead, covered in blood in a bathtub, and the person she entrusted with their care stabbing herself, Kevin had been out of town in California on a work trip. In fact, as Marina was finding her children, Kevin was on a flight headed home. He describes that as he landed, he turned his phone on only to see a barrage of messages and voicemails, which sent him into an immediate panic. He listened to the voice messages and he heard the sounds of Marina screaming and crying, absolutely hysterical. He was able to gather from these messages that two of his children were dead, but didn't know which ones and didn't know how. As soon as they landed, flight crew notified the passengers that one person needed to get off immediately. That was when New York police officers escorted Kevin off the plane. When exiting the plane, Kevin said that he just collapsed onto the floor. Everything after that was a blur. He doesn't even remember if he walked out of that airport or if police had to carry him out. Once he arrived to the hospital where his children were, he was immediately met with news reporters before being ushered into a room by himself. That is when he was met with medical staff who notified him that his two children, Lulu and Leo, were dead. Of course, this sent him into a hysteria of crying, screaming, and just falling to the ground. When Marina entered the room with him, they just held each other and cried. They wanted to be there for one another. 
In that moment, Kevin told Marina that they weren't going to let this tear them apart. Eventually, Kevin asked the staff to see his kids so he could say goodbye. The bodies had been cleaned the best that they could be at that point, but again, they were so bloody that parts of their body and especially their hair were stained with blood, but they cleaned them the best they could and Kevin and Marina were able to say their goodbyes. After finding the bodies of these two young children, they were taken to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy, and I'm sure you can guess, but just as a warning, the details of what the ME found are absolutely horrific and really hard to hear. What these children went through is just so heartbreaking and brutal, so this is your warning now. It was found that two-year-old Leo was stabbed five times all over his little body with one fatal slash to his throat. It was said that he was either surprised by the attack and just couldn't fight back or he was too little to fight back. Meanwhile, his sister, six-year-old Lulu, was stabbed over 30 times. She had been slashed in the throat, but it was clear that she tried to fight back with everything she had. She had stab wounds and slashes all over her arms, torso, and back, all indicating that she was trying to get away. According to the ME, both of their throats had been slashed so deeply that it appeared that both of them were almost decapitated. It was a frenzied, violent attack carried out by a woman who those kids loved, a woman who was supposed to care for them and protect them. Now, like I said, when first responders arrived to the scene, they found Yoslin had also attempted to take her own life by cutting her own throat and wrists multiple times. She too landed herself a hospital visit where she was in a coma for two days after. She woke up on October 27th and by that time, police met with her for an interview. At the time, she was intubated, so she couldn't speak, so she had to write down what she had to say. Like I said earlier, the relationship between Yoslin and the rest of the family appeared to be a very good one. She was happy. She only had positive things to say about them, and the family was happy to have her. In the weeks before the murders, there had been some issues, but the Crims felt that they were doing everything they could to bend over backwards to support her. However, this is not how Yoslin saw the situation at all. She said that the relationship she had with the Crims, specifically Marina, was crumbling in the weeks leading to October 25th, 2012. She said that the issue started with Marina giving her grief about giving the kids junk food and not spending enough time with them. Then, once her son came and she told the family that she needed some extra money, they offered her five extra hours a week to clean the house. The Crims felt that this offer was a way of doing something nice for her, trying their best to give her extra hours and therefore extra pay. However, this isn't how Yaslin took it. She said that she was angry that they were asking her to clean the house, writing, quote, I had to do everything and take care of the kids. I worked as a babysitter only and she wanted me to do everything. She wanted five hours of cleaning a week. She said that it interfered with her doctor's appointments and time to see her son. She also said that the soap they had at the apartment was burning her skin. Although Marina did buy organic cleaner to try and accommodate her sensitive skin, this still did not make Yaslin happy. In fact, she was pissed about this offer and she stewed about it for weeks, unbeknownst to Marina. Then when the Crim started recommending her to other families to pick up extra hours nannying, she saw that as a slight, a way to get rid of her and make her work even more. It seemed that with her increasing financial strain, Yoslin basically wanted the Crims to pay her for extra hours she wasn't working. The kicker is, though, is that Yoslin never sat down with Marina or Kevin and asked for a raise. She just got upset about the suggestion that she clean and never really did anything else about it until she absolutely freaked out. Basically, it seemed that, yes, the Crims knew that Yoslin was struggling and they wanted to help her in any way they could. They also saw that Yoslin was starting to slack a bit and was not performing her duties as she normally had over the past two years they worked with her. However, everything they did to try and help, Yoslin took that as an insult. Again, unbeknownst to the family. According to Yoslin, the big event that really pushed her over the edge happened on the night before the murders. When she left their home on the evening of October 24th, Yoslin said goodbye to Marina, but apparently Marina ignored her. 
This made Yoslin very, very angry. She sat and stewed about it until she returned to the apartment for her shift the next day. As I stated earlier, on the afternoon of October 25th, Yoslin put Leo in the stroller and picked up Lulu from school. She was supposed to take Lulu to her ballet lessons, but she didn't. She went to the apartment instead. When she got there, she asked the doorman if Marina was home, which she wasn't. She then went upstairs and into the apartment. According to Yoslin, she does not remember anything that happened after that. After she was finished at the hospital, of course, Yoslin was very quickly arrested and charged with the murders of these two innocent, adorable children. And although she admitted to murdering the children and despite being caught basically in the act, she pleaded not guilty to her charges. Why? Due to reason of insanity or mental defect. That's right, she was blaming her mental health for the murder of these children. Of course, because of this, an investigation into her past and mental health was done, and let me tell you, pretty much everything that I've told you about Yoslin up to this point is just the absolute tip of the iceberg. The information I'm going to tell you comes from a combination of investigators speaking with various family members, as well as through interviews with psychiatrists working to evaluate her competency to stand trial. So now going back a bit into more of Yoslin's family history. Like I said, she's originally from the DR before she and other siblings moved to New York. There, she lived with several siblings and worked a couple different jobs before moving and living for a few months in Texas, where she took care of a family member's children. Meanwhile, she had a son back in the DR who was raised by her sister after she moved. Now, according to family members, Yoslin first started experiencing mental health issues when she was around 16 years old. One of her sisters unfortunately died around this time, which sent Yoslin into a depression. She went to the doctor, who prescribed her medications, which she took until she felt better and no longer needed them. Obviously, something like a death in the family, especially of a sibling, can cause anyone to have a depressive episode. But, as we will hear later in the video, apparently Yoslin was still dealing with other mental health struggles that she kept to herself for the most part. After having Jesus, she did raise him for the first years of his life. According to Jesus, his mom was always very paranoid. She didn't want him to go outside. She was constantly worried about intruders coming into their home, which made Jesus feel like he needed to like lock the apartment windows and like sleep with a bat and things like that. She was so worried about something happening to Jesus that she made him quit the baseball team. However, Jesus never heard anything about her seeing things or hearing things, so even though she was paranoid, it never seemed like she was delusional or anything like that. Again, yes, she was really worried about her child's safety. Yes, she might have gone overboard with how worried she was and how much of like, I guess, a helicopter mom she was, but that doesn't mean that she was delusional or suffering from a severe mental health issue. After moving to New York, like I said, Yoslin carried a number of different jobs. Her sister Celia took up work as a nanny, which was a job she enjoyed. The family Celia worked for went to the same preschool and ballet classes as the Crim's daughters, and that is how they met. As we know, Celia recommended Yoslin to Marina to be their nanny, saying that she had tons of experience in the field. Yoslin even sent Marina her resume, which had glowing references. However, turns out, these references were pretty much all fabricated. She did list the family members whose children she had cared for for those months in Texas, who raved all about Yoslin. However, Another one of the references she listed was her niece, Yaklin. When Marina reached out to her, she sent her a detailed letter about the two years Yaslin spent caring for her two-year-old son. When Marina asked her how she met Yaslin, Yaklin said that she was recommended to them by another nanny. Right off the bat, we know that was a lie. Of course, Marina didn't know that Yaklin was just a family member. What Marina also didn't know was that Yaklin didn't even have any children. Yes, she completely made up the whole story about Yaslin caring for a two-year-old child that does not exist. Now, going back to the first one I mentioned, that was her family member of the kids that she took care of. She did actually take care of their children, but she did say that it was a family she was not related to, so that part of it was also a lie. 
there were a few other references listed, all of whom were her family members who all lied about the experience they have with Yaslin as a nanny. Then, about two months before the murders, family members of Yaslin report that they noticed her mental health getting worse and worse. She often complained of this man who was following her around and trying to separate her from her family. Another friend talked about how Yaslin reported seeing shadows all around her. At this point, though, none of her family members ever mentioned her hearing voices or seeing the devil or anything like that, but obviously, these visions are concerning. Family members said that what they think caused her mental health to tank again after years of getting better was her son moving to New York. Again, there was this enormous financial strain placed on her by her trying to get her own apartment and then losing it. She enrolled him in a school she couldn't afford. During that time, family members who lived with Yoselin said that she was prone to bouts of crying. She was facing all of these stressors at one time, her son's arrival, stress at work, and financial trouble. All of that culminated in her becoming so overwhelmed that she felt she could no longer take care of her own son. This may have caused her to snap and black out, causing her to lash out on those two children. The process of evaluating her mental health and preparing for this trial actually took over five long years. Ultimately, she was found competent to stand trial. So finally, by March of 2018, Yoselin's trial for the double murder started. She was being charged with two counts of first-degree murder. The prosecution painted Yoselin as an evil, cruel, cold, calculated murderer. This was a woman who came from humble beginnings, a woman who immigrated into the United States having to find work where she could to get by and lived with several other family members who all worked together to support one another. By the grace of good luck, she was able to find employment with this rich, affluent family on the Upper West Side as a nanny. But during her years of working with Marina and her children, she grew envious. Here was this woman who seemed to have it all, a rich husband who supported her. She was a naturally gifted mother who effortlessly loved and cared for her children, taking them on trips to the park and the pumpkin patch, made their own Halloween costumes by scratch. She lived in a ritzy apartment in an upper-class neighborhood just a block away from Central Park and the historical museums. Meanwhile, Yoslin was struggling. She didn't even have the money to have an apartment with her own son. She didn't have the money to send him to private school. And she made that the crim's problem. She didn't want to work the extra hours. She didn't want to be referred to another family. She just wanted them to pay her more and more money simply because they could afford it. It was their fault that they weren't being more generous with their money. After months of this growing disdain for Marina, after, I guess, being ignored by her that one time that really just sealed the deal for Yoslin, and she planned out this murder as a way to hurt her in the worst way possible. As we heard from earlier, her not saying goodbye to her that previous night made her very upset. So she went to the apartment and checked in with the doorman to make sure she wasn't home. She specifically chose a time where she knew Marina would not be home so she could be alone with the children. She then went into the kitchen, grabbed two large kitchen knives before bringing the children to the bathroom where she carried out the violent frenzied attack. She waited in the bathroom for who knows how long before Marina got back to her apartment. Yaslin waited for Marina to find the bodies of her dead, brutalized children so she could relish in her pain and anguish. It was only after seeing Marina's shock and horror that Yaslin started hurting herself. The fact that she waited for the opportunity to be alone and made sure she was going to be alone. The fact that she grabbed the knives and went into another room. The fact that she had all of these complaints about Marina the second she woke up in that hospital. That all shows that she planned this and carried it out because she hated Marina and wanted to see her suffer. 
not because she had this random, uncontrolled mental health crisis that caused her to lash out at the children at some random, unpredictable time. On the other hand, the defense argued again that Yaslin did this due to a mental defect which caused temporary insanity. She didn't know what she was doing and she had no control over her actions. The defense explained how Yaslin had a mental disorder from the time that she was a child, but she was really good at hiding it because mental health help just wasn't good back then. It wasn't as accepted to have mental health issues as it is today. They argue that she started experiencing paranoid delusions and visual and audio hallucinations from the time that she was a child, but she just couldn't tell anybody about it. In her sessions with the psychiatrist after the murders, she brought up hearing voices which demanded her to do things, including these murders. She also mentioned that she can see Jesus and the devil and that she can hear the devil talking to her. At the time of the murders, she told the psychiatrist that she felt the devil penetrate her body and she heard voices demanding her to kill. She said the devil made her do this. But something the prosecution pointed out was that no one, including Yoslin, brought up those hallucinations until after the murders. In fact, Yoslin only brought up the devil when prompted by her psychiatrist who was evaluating her after the murders. He specifically asked her if she saw the devil and ever felt possessed. It was only then that she ever brought this up. Even when telling her family members about her symptoms, she never mentioned hearing or seeing the devil or anything like that. But even so, I do want to say that even if her family members support her story of having a mental health disorder, even with them saying that she, you know, had struggled with her mental health since the time she was a child, it's absolutely possible they're lying. We know several of Yaslin's family members lied to the Krim family about her qualifications. They lied to investigators all throughout this investigation, even admitting to lying under oath. So again, even if they report her having mental health issues, these people just are not credible and we don't know what to believe if anything that comes out of their mouths. The court also heard from a psychologist who actually saw Yoslin just three days before the murders. This was someone who had just started seeing her due to her worsening mental health. This psychiatrist is actually one of New York's experts in how and when to report dangerous patients to authorities. And he said that he found absolutely no sign of a serious mental defect in Yaslin. He just saw a stressed out woman who was dealing with a lot. She was only diagnosed with anxiety and mild depression. Again, just going directly against this thought that she was delusional and out of control. I do also want to note that a lot of people do hide their mental illnesses, but people with delusions are called delusional for a reason. They don't know that they're delusions. A lot of times when they're having hallucinations and you know hearing the voices telling them to do things and seeing things, they don't know what's real and what's not. When they're delusional, they truly believe in their delusions, again, which is why they're called delusions to begin with. They wouldn't know that they should hide them. So that whole thing to me just does not make sense and is not credible. At the trial, the jury heard from numerous witnesses, including psychiatrists, Marina and Kevin, several of Yoslin's family members, including her son, neighbors of both families who spoke on Yoslin's behaviors, as well as first responders responders who spoke about the brutality of the scene they discovered. While testifying, it was clear that Marina was still so traumatized from what happened. She called Yoslin evil and disgusting several times in the courtroom and broke down into tears multiple times. At one point, she screamed at Yoslin saying, you're evil, you love this, you like this, before having to be escorted out to take a break. On the other hand, Kevin was able to talk in a very matter-of-fact way, wiping away tears as he spoke. It's clear that he's also still very traumatized from all of this, and they both probably will be for the rest of their lives. It's like a total horror movie. I walk down the hall, and I see the light on under the door, she said. I see Lulu. I knew that she was dead. She's lying in the bathtub, and her eyes are open. I see Leo next to her. They had blood on them. Then I see the defendant, blood all over her and eyes bugging out. All I remember saying to her is, I hate you. 
Prosecutors say Lulu tried desperately to defend herself. She knew what was happening, she understood what the defendant was doing, and she fought to live. And the defendant repaid Lulu's resistance with almost 30 different stab and slash wounds to her body and her neck. Prosecutors describe the children's wounds in painfully graphic detail. They claim Ortega was angry at the Crims for overworking her and was resentful of Marina Crim for being able to provide for her children in a way she could not. The defense says the 55-year-old caregiver was suffering from mental illness and was unaware of the consequences of her actions. The evidence will show that she has a corroborated history of hearing voices and dissociating from reality since the age of 16. During the two years Ortega worked for the family, Krim says Ortega never complained about any struggles that would lead to her actions on that horrible fall day. The devastated mother says, quote, she killed my best friends. And when leaving the courtroom, Krim turned to Ortega and said, you're gross, you're disgusting. It was said that all throughout the trial, through all of this testimony, seeing the evidence, including seeing pictures of those dead children and Yoslin herself with those self-inflicted injuries, Yoslin did not show any emotion. She was actually trying to make eye contact with everyone who testified, including Marina and Kevin, but nobody wanted to look in her direction. She just had this blank stare on her face, looking stoic and flat the entire time, almost as if she was trying to intimidate everybody in that courtroom. Many people who have observed the trial and who looked into this case can see that Yoslin is just a cold-blooded narcissist who only cares about herself and takes everything that anyone tries to do for her as a slight and takes everything in the worst way possible. The worst kind of person, if you ask me. After a month of trial, both sides made their closing arguments and the jury of 12 were sent off for deliberations. And thankfully, when they came back, they made it clear that they did not buy this load of BS that Yoslin was selling. They found her guilty on both charges of first-degree murder, and she was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. At her sentencing, Yoslin actually spoke up and apologized to Marina and Kevin for what she did and showed her first bit of emotion that she had shown the entire time. I'm very sorry for everything that happened. They're overlapping, happy, but I hope that no one, particularly you, goes through what I have gone through. Although many people wish me all the worst. My life is in the hands of God. I am in jail. 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 I am but perhaps there are many more that are more in prison than I am. There are no mucho perdón. I ask for a great deal of forgiveness. A Dios. God. A Marina. To Marina. A Kirk. To Kevin. To me. This just shows even more how much of a selfish narcissist she is, given that the only time she showed a hint of emotion was after she could no longer hope for her defense to go through. She was hit with the harsh reality that she will be in prison forever, surrounded by other women who do not take kindly to people who hurt children. Both Kevin and Marina made their victim impact statements where they each recounted memories of their children and spoke about just how special each child was in their own way. In their remarks, they also spoke about Yoslin herself. Kevin said, quote, the defendant is evil, an utterly dangerous narcissist, and a complete failure. It is right that she should have to live and rot and die in a concrete and metal cage like the ugly dark shadow of Lulu and Leo's bright shining lights. My family and I, we create and build. The defendant and her family, they destroy and ruin. The defendant set out to destroy what Kevin and I had created and built. An inspired, happy, thriving family. But she failed. What actually happened is the defendant destroyed her own family. She has destroyed the pride her family once felt. She has destroyed any sense of peace they'll ever have. We have seen the true colors of her and her family members because of this. There's a terrible pattern of terrible judgment. And lying and deceiving people is a way of life for this family. Any shred of dignity the defendant's family had after the murders has been destroyed. 
Over the past five and a half years, the defendant has shown not an ounce of remorse. It was one of our top priorities as parents that our kids learn to take care of each other, that they become the best friends for each other, that they realize that no one would ever be more loyal to them than they were to each other. And they were a team. Fights always ended in a sorry and a real hug. A funny thing was how Leo, even when he wasn't involved, would say, sorry Lulu, sorry Nessie, and give them a hug as well. Lulu from day one was our little Buddha. She felt deeply and intuitively. She was the most empathetic soul I've ever known. I think that's why she was such a beautiful and creative artist. And if you knew Lulu, you knew creating art was like breathing for her. Our handsome little Leo saw the world clearly and loved it. He wanted to vacuum it up into his bursting little brain. He was so smart, so curious. He absolutely loved his stroller rides, his front seat view of the streets of Manhattan, soaking up the people, the buildings, the cranes, the trucks, and taxis. He adored trips to the park, to the farm. He was a collector, a collector of acorns, toy trucks, balls. Often his biggest worry in life was fitting all his collectibles in his chubby little hands. Marina, Nessie, and I lost much more than two-fifths of our family when Lulu and Leo died. We lost the brightest and warmest of lights, and we will mourn their absences for the rest of our lives. The defendant, the defense, and her family have behaved shamelessly in this court and outside of it. Over five and a half years, they have not shown an inkling of remorse not from the defendant or her entire extended family, not a single word or action of sorrow or any other decent human emotion. Just selfishness and an utter disregard for morals or ethics or basic human decency. Judge Cara, this defendant and her defense rejected two plea bargain offers from you. Marina and I were against these offers, as you know. But we also knew she would undoubtedly reject them because, being the malignant narcissist that she is, she would never accept responsibility and say aloud in front of this court that she was guilty. We also knew she wanted to put Marina and the rest of us through the pain of this trial, and it was awful. Awful and wrong that the jury had to go through that, that everyone in this court every day had to go through that. And let's be sure everyone listening today acknowledges and never forgets this. It was a disorderly, callous, venal, crass, manipulative, manipulative indecent, ignorant, self-engrossed, pointless, shameless, and at its core, an utterly dishonest and brutally cruel defense. The defendant is an evil and utterly dangerous narcissist and a complete failure. It is right that she should live and rot and die in a concrete and metal cage, like the ugly dark shadow of Lulu and Leo's bright shining lights. And more importantly, it is right that she will go from being hated by the world to being forgotten by the world before she's even dead. After her conviction and sentence, Yoslin tried to appeal her conviction, but it has since been upheld and she remains behind bars, hopefully for the rest of her life. Of course, the Crims are and always will be devastated by this tragic, heartbreaking loss, but they have decided to use this tragedy to do something positive. This is something I always find so incredibly impressive and inspiring when people are able to take the worst possible tragedy and use it to make something positive. Since the brutal murders, Kevin and Marina have created the Lulu and Leo Fund, which helps to fund Choose Creativity. The fund is a nonprofit organization that aims to inspire, heal, and grow children through engagement with art, nature, and creativity. Children from disadvantaged areas are 50% less likely to participate in arts programs than those from upper-class families. So this organization aims to bring art and science programs to schools in disadvantaged areas, serving thousands of kids each year in honor of these two lost souls gone far too soon. After this tragedy, the family knew that they needed to start over. Thankfully, Kevin and Marina found a way to stay together and work through this as a family. 
they ended up moving away from that apartment. They went on to have two more sons, Felix, who was born about a year after Lulu and Leo's deaths, and Linus, who was born two years after the deaths. They have been able to find joy and happiness in their lives, saying that Nessie especially has shown such incredible strength through all of this. Somehow, she's able to live in the present and enjoy life despite everything she's gone through. Even if you never met Lulu and Leo, you feel like you know them, you love them, and you're inspired by them like we are. So a lot of people have been asking us how they can help, how they can support us during this really horrible time. And we thought about it, and we realized that we're going to handle this the way we've handled everything. We're going to focus on the positive and the goodness that's come out of all this. When you hear about us on the news or we come up in conversation, we want you to tell people about the Lou and Leo Fund and the Choose Creativity Initiative and the 10 Principles of Creativity. This is the legacy of Lou and Leo, and this is what matters. So this is how you can help us. So Nessie, Felix, and Linus are here to tell you what the Lou and Leo Fund and Choose Creativity are all about. The Lulu and Leo Fund is a nonprofit that supports creative education. It was inspired by my sister and brother Lulu and Leo. They loved being creative. I want everybody to know that they are creative and creativity is inside them forever. Practice creativity like it's a sport. The more practice, the better you get. That's what the 10 principles are for, to remind you how to live your life with creativity. And remember, choose creativity is equal parts choose and creativity. In the face of destructive things like violence, anger, and fear, creativity is a positive act of defiance. You can use this in your lives, you can be inspired by this, and you can help us by sharing Choose Creativity with everyone you know. Go to our website, choosecreativity.org, to contact us and see if this curriculum is right for your school, for your after-school program, for your community. Thanks again for your support. This was definitely a really difficult case to get through. The facts of this case are just horrific and the way this happened is unimaginable. I'm glad that this monster is behind bars and will never see the outside of a prison ever again. I'm happy that the Krim family were able to build themselves back up and move on while honoring the memory of Leo and Lulu through servicing so many children in need. But that is where I'm going to end today's video, and now I want to hear your thoughts. Do you think that Yoslin truly was just envious of the family and killed those children to make Marina suffer? Or do you believe her that it was all a mental illness? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put up new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn those notification bells to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure to follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.